Hey guys, welcome to uh, this episode of Low Carb in the Leaves with me, Dr. Mary Barson. Uh, this week we're talking about mindset. Um, I'm examining my own mindset today. I'm a little bit late today doing this and I did have this little like, oh, oh, I've got so much to do. I can't possibly do this. I have my own little little mindset block about coming here and talking to you fabulous people, even though I like it and enjoy it and I know that it is entirely doable. I ooh, let's hear that. need to um, spend time examining the stories in my head as well. So anyway, I'm here now and I am very happy to be here. So I, I've said this before, but I used to believe back when I was struggling with my own polycystic ovarian syndrome and my own weight gain issues many years ago, like my early adulthood, that weight loss was just like 80% exercise and 20% diet. And that 20% diet was low fat, high carb, being hungry. And then they felt the hungrier I was, the better I must be doing. And that if I wasn't slogging away at the gym for extraordinary amounts of time, then I wasn't doing my best to control my polycystic ovarian syndrome and my weight. And yeah, back then I was relative, I mean, I was, I had severe insulin resistance because I had polycystic ovarian syndrome, but most 20 year olds don't actually have um, insulin resistance like I did. Most 20 year olds are probably quite insulin resistant and don't need to do a lot to manage their weight. Some definitely do, and I was one of them. Um, but many don't. And I can remember when I lived in, um, in Ballarat, I was at the Ballarat Clinical School and I lived in a hostel with, uh, I don't know, I think it was about 30 other medical students. We were all there doing our rural clinical term together. And it was incredibly fun. It was a really lovely place to be surrounded by my colleagues, you know, in my 20s, living with a whole lot of med students. A um, bit stressful as we were learning medicine, but it was still a lot of fun. And I can remember just being dumbfounded at what other people ate and seeing my weight relative to their weight, looking at what I ate relative to what they ate and thinking that life was so, so incredibly unfair. And it's true, I, say, I hang out with these awesome, awesome people um, who would bake cupcakes every day and eat them, um, you know, would have lots of takeaway and beer and all of these things that, I mean, if I did them, I would have gained weight like bilio but they ate them and they didn't. So I developed this story in my head throughout that time. First of all, that it was a bit of hopelessness. It's just like, there's nothing I can do. It's so unfair that I've got PCOS and they don't and that I gain weight and they don't. Um, fair bit of anger as well in my mind. Lots and lots of stories in my head. And one thing, one little story that did creep in was a bit of learned helplessness. This idea that no matter what I did, nothing would work. And this is what can happen when you've got insulin resistance and you try standard dietary advice of calorie restriction and exercising a lot. It can certainly work for a while and it does work to a degree, but it can't work sustainably because it doesn't get down to the actual cause of the metabolic disturbance that is healing the high insulin. And I see this with people who have had been yo-yo dieters their entire life have felt that it's incredibly unfair because you know what it actually it is like it's not your but it's not really your fault if you've got the genes for insulin resistance it's not your fault it is however your responsibility same with sugar addiction sugar is like almost literally shoved down our throats everywhere you go you go to buy your petrol at the Caltech service station they're like would you like two chocolate bars for the price of one it's everywhere and if that is your drug of choice it's really 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 difficult and I would argue that it isn't your fault if you've got a sugar addiction or a carb addiction it's not your fault but it is your responsibility and the wondrous thing about a low carb lifestyle is that it can really heal the cravings and it can heal the metabolic causes behind it and while all that wonderful internal healing is going on, then there's all of this mind healing that needs to go on to help keep you on track, to unlearn all the horrible things that we've learned, to unlearn calorie counting, to unlearn that learned helplessness, to unlearn that fat is bad, to unlearn that salt is bad, 
uh, to unlearn that it is all about calories. And during that unlearning time, you need to be kind to yourself and you need to support your brain. <sighs> so brain support is my final low carb in the leaves episode for this week and great ways to support your brain mindfulness and meditation like I discussed yesterday just three minutes in the car park can make a wondrous difference sleep so good for your brain to get good sleep eating good food is incredibly good for your brain um, fasting really good for your brain and being kind and compassionate to yourself and just as people can spiral downwards into negative thought patterns that result in negative feelings and actions that result in in you know actions of eating all the things and not getting the results that you want you can also spiral upwards you absolutely can you can spiral up and up and up with good habits and good habits beget good habits and the more we heal our brain the more we are able to manage our mind the more we're able to make good decisions the more we're able to heal our brain the more we're able to manage our mind the more we're able to make good decisions and you can find you just catapult yourself into a much happier and better place with just a few simple steps all right, wonderful humans, have a great weekend and uh, we will see you again on Monday. Bye now.